the question of risk came up. Um, I thought I'd change um, the, the sequence of slides. So I'm now starting on slide pack three, um, which includes two key areas. One is the nature of a incident, uh, the nature of um, an event, and also, most importantly, the phases of being prepared for an event and responding to an event, and then the risk piece, because that, that was specifically asked. Okay, so just a reminder uh, why we're here, develop a good working level understanding of risk on your team management and planning as applicable all parts of a full service airline and to form a foundation for development of core expertise in business continuity management. So this slide pack, um, so last one we went through developing a PCM framework and different ways of managing events depending on the scale, how big they are. So the next bit is um, risk mapping the business. Um, and there's two, two things I'm going to introduce is the idea of stages of, risk, of preparing for and responding and then how about how we consider risk. So um, the first point is um, we can break down the process of business continuity planning into four phases. Oops. Okay, I didn't expect that. <laughs> okay. Um, and this, um, this in a lot of the textbooks is called the four R's, because in the English language, each word starts with R, reduction, uh, readiness, response, and recovery. Pardon, sorry, uh, can you share the screen, please? Oh, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I will not be making a lot of you sense to you. I beg your pardon. I'll go back to the beginning. <laughs> yes, please. I uh, beg your pardon, beg your pardon, beg your pardon. Okay, let's start again. So. As I said, this is pack slide pack three um, of four packs, but I've skipped some slides from the previous one. Um, the objective of the course, which we've just gone through, uh, as I said, we looked at developing a business continuity management framework and looked at the management of events in four different levels of ways of managing events, depending on their scale. So the next bit I'm going to go through now is risk mapping the business. Okay, sorry about that. Now it'll sure make a lot more sense. <laughs> four, I've said there's four phases. We can break down continuity response planning into four phases. And if we look at a timeline from left to right, um, from now through to an event and on to the future, we can say that the initial part of business continuity management is about reducing risk. The next part is about being ready for an event. So when an event occurs, we can respond correctly and then recover from the situation. So the textbooks talk about four R's because in the English language, each of these words begins with R. So one, two, three, four, four R's. So I don't know what the words would be in, in Vietnamese, um, but you could use slightly different words, but what they mean is first point is to reduce the vulnerability, reduce the level of risk on a business. The second is to be ready for when something happens be prepared, then it happens, whatever it is, and have in place a response plan. You know how you're going to respond to a different type, a certain type of event. And then once you've responded, you've got to recover from that and recover the revenue, recover 
the customers recover the market, whatever it might be. So this is a framework I particularly like because it's it's quite easy to remember and it's very logical. Uh, and it's, as far as I'm being aware, it, it was developed a long time ago. I don't know who developed it, um, but it is a lot of the textbooks use this approach. So in a very simple thinking, a simple approach to business continuity planning, he would say an event occurs, it causes a very rapid impact on the business. So this is impact on the scale and this is timeline along here. The event occurs and the impact is almost immediate. Rapidly developing events and you quickly recognize that there's something wrong and you respond appropriately, you respond strongly. And then because you've responded, you reduce the impact on your business and eventually over time, there is no impact. So again, this is a lot of textbooks show this idea. So everyone follow that graph. So that's the level of impact conceptually and the time, timeline from the time of the event through the time it takes to fully recover from the event. And we're saying a typical, typical event happens very quickly, you respond appropriately and you recover the situation. However, it might be, and we talked about this a little bit, a chronic events, that actually the event happens and it takes a while for a response to be felt. So it might not be rapid. And so it might be not so obvious that something has happened. And the example I gave from my own experience is SARS. It was happening. It seemed to be another part of a world. I didn't worry about it. But then our crew started expressing concern and another manager called me and said, I think we've got a problem. Um, and so we responded, but it took a while, it took a while. And then we responded um, and recovered. And that is probably quite normal, you know, not all events, obvious. But I'm suggesting in the aviation business, it's usually very rapid but it takes longer to recover than a lot of businesses because we have so much complexity. We get aircraft in the wrong location. Uh, we have crews in the wrong location. Um, we have passengers to recover. Um, all sorts of flow on effects. And actually it can take quite a long time for an airline business to fully recover from some events. And I think, um, SARS was a good example where some airlines were very badly affected and it took them a long time to recover. And I did briefly mention CAFE um, earlier. CAFE were very significantly affected by SARS. Effectively, you know, they were the epicenter. Um, SARS-1, I think we'd call it SARS-1. Um, and so this period was a very significant event. They had to um, spend a lot of time recovering, but they also had to not only respond to event, but recover the market and recover the passengers and recover the, the willingness of people to travel. Um, so it's a really interesting case study, I think, Cafe in that case, just how long it took them to recover. Um, and I think some of the examples from the art or list or, um, that I showed you earlier, it was some years for some airlines to fully recover the level of uh, revenue that had been the case before the event. So something to bear in mind. Okay, so I've talked about response. I've talked about recovery. So there's two R's. And I introduced the idea of reduction and readiness. 
So how can we des describe that in more detail? And as part of trying to that, describe that to my own executive team when I tried to implement this four hours approach, uh, was to try and think what that looked like in different parts of the business. And so I developed a, a matrix that looks like this. So I'll try and step through it. Now, you could show it in different ways. This just happened to be, for me, the best way to try and describe it to other people. And to, to show that within the business, that might look different depending what aspect of what type of incident we're referring to. So reduction really means risk reduction, reducing the risk on a business. So this is nothing to do with responding. It's about trying to limit the effect that a recognized event might have on the business. So the most obvious example in an aviation organization is aviation emergencies, aircraft emergencies. How do we reduce risk for an aviation emergency? Well, in aviation, it's all very, very controlled and we have operational standards, SARPs, SOPs, AOPs, flight procedures. Everyone is following procedures. Very, very mature system. We all do it the same effectively right across the world under a IR, sorry, a KO system. We all follow a KO SARPs, with just a few differences maybe. And it's very, very effective. And over many years, the chance of an aviation accident or true aviation emergency reduced in terms of likelihood because of this. We've reduced the risk in the aviation system significantly over many, many years by developing operational standards, obviously in technical standards, the way aircraft are built, the standards they have to meet, uh, types of certificates, whole e And so, as part of developing a readiness, being ready to respond, we develop plans, emergency response plans. We train people. It might be the next akin team. It might be the go team. It might be our operational response team. It might be the emergency center team. We train, train, train. I mean, we carry out exercises from time to time. Let's exercise an emergency and test our procedures, our plans, and our people. And we build teams. We have response teams ready to go should there be an emergency. So that comes under the second R, the readiness. And then we do respond or we practice our responses, which is we might have an emergency center. Most people would of some description set up, whiteboards, uh, ready, ready checklists, communication systems. Um, and we perhaps will use IATA guidance on how to do that. It's effectively a command and control system. Chief pilot or some other person, chief executives, um, head of engineering, really senior people all get together. All right, let's manage this. Um, teams all ready to go and we practice it. And then finally, probably less practice, but we need to be very conscious of it, is that's going to have a very significant effect on the airline, on its people, on its brand, the emotional aspect, aspect, the resourcing to recover, next in crew support, brand management, for example. This all has to happen after an event. And some airlines have clearly been through this. Um, not all, but some have had their 
major accident and have had to respond to it and then recover from it. So that's quite easy to, to understand. If necessary, respond to it and then recovery is the next step. Okay. But when we're talking about um, business continuity, we recognize that there may be a whole range of different types of events. Um, even if we don't have business continuity planning in place, we do have uh, significant sites, for example, engineering where things can go wrong with fuel depots, all sorts of things where you could have an emergency. And normally there will be, to reduce risk, we follow codes, standards, industry standards. Um, we have good work practices, we have procedures in place, and we manage facilities professionally to reduce the risk associated with a certain site, chemicals, fuel of the obvious ones. But also we need to be ready for an event. So any fuel depot, for example, will have emergency plans, but people will be trained, should be excised from time to time. And you may also be managing shifts. So we have the right people on shift at any one time. So that's all about readiness, right people available and knowing what they would do. And also, if there was an incident, people know exactly how they would respond. Crash fire may respond, for example. Likely to be the immediate person in charge. You may decide that this a significant site emergency. If you're in charge of that site, you might need to call it in the emergency center that you've used here. And again, if it's a significant event, you may have to call in a command and control type approach if it's directly affected with, um, associated with the airline or a subsidiary. And then similarly, you've got to recover, um, either recover because a site isn't available, but also there may have been injuries, you might have to support staff, and there may be some reflection on the brand. Okay. I'm now going to go to this line where I've called it business continuity. No, no, sorry, I'll go to this one first. Workplace emergencies, uh, very similar to site emergencies. You may be using dangerous chemicals on a, in a work site. And so you reduce risk by having management plans, people trained. Um, you may have wardens. You may exercise from time to time. In response planning, it may involve civil agencies, but certainly you'll have oversight of what's going on. And similarly, if it's associated with the airline, you may have to manage a response longer term. Okay, business continuity. How do we manage, how do we reduce risk in business continuity? Essentially, we have to go through a risk profiling, profiling exercise. We have to understand the risk to the business. Unlike these examples, where usually there are compliance requirements laid down that we just follow, the law requires this or the regulations require that, essentially the regulations are a risk reduction method. In this case, that hasn't been done for us. We have to do this for ourselves. We have to think, okay, what is the likelihood of a certain type of event? How will it impact us? Or how will it impact this function or another function? What, what are the risks? First, we've got to identify risk. We've got to understand the impact. We've got to understand the likelihood. So we've got to effectively go through the whole business and do a business impact assessment is one term that's often used in the textbook business impact assessment. 
essentially assessing what would be impact of a given event. And we've got to protect the processes of a business uses, the processes of taking bookings, managing check-in, keeping track of passengers, ensuring we're meeting all the regulations, um, aircraft are ready. How do we protect them to make sure they can continue to work? And this is where we come back to what's important in the business, that customer journey. What is real-time operations and important, but also what is perhaps not real-time, but is imperative that we keep it functioning to allow the business to work. And then maybe what's less important. And so we focus our effort where it's needed. They have to communicate those plans so that each of the departments or critical people are aware of the role they will play in a given plan. And that is actually quite involved because you may be talking about an event that it's quite rare and people won't have seen before. So the communication can be has to be quite involved at times and likely involve exercises. Let's exercise a given event. And it's likely that this will be managed at the department level. Um, for, for a lot of events, not all, a more significant one by a response team. So the question is how, how often do we exercise? And that will depend on the level of risk and the complexity of a response. Okay, and then if an event occurs, we've got to respond. So how is that done? It's likely there's a business continuity manager who might have overseen the development of the plans and the teams. But as I showed you before, we may already have predefined teams set up to respond depending on the type of event. So it might be departmental man. setting of, of a more senior team, a centralized team. And then lastly, there's was recovery. Recover the business, support staff during the recovery, but also you may have to recover the market and of course protect the brand. So the market recovery, I mentioned CAFE a few times now, that is what they had to do after SARS their market effectively collapsed. They had to work with the authorities of the time, the Hong Kong authorities of the time, to encourage people to come back to Hong Kong, to encourage airlines to fly through Hong Kong, um, to rebuild a tourist market for Hong Kong, uh, to recover confidence in the market. Uh, SARS is finished, we're clean, we're good, everything's healthy. And that actually was a very significant piece of work in their case. And it's, it's, it was held up for a time as a case study of how to do it because they did it very, very well. But it was interesting that it took a lot of effort and this recovery bit is often forgotten. And actually it may be very significant effort we could recover. Okay, um, so that's how I explained the three R's to my executive team when I was developing a system for Air New Zealand. I found it, um, you could describe it in different ways depending on the type of business, but this four R's I think is a very effective way to look at how you really go through the process of developing a, risk, a business continuity response. The, the, what I find valuable is it's, it includes this risk reduction. You aren't just victims. You aren't just subject to the circumstances. You can actually do something to reduce risk. 
set up an alternative um, operation center, for example, have two sites for critical function, have a backup data center, understand which systems need to be backed up, put the effort into those systems. Um, there's an example here in New Zealand, actually, I'm just thinking, um, aviation business, the air navigation service provider, Airways New Zealand. So their main uh, control center was in Christchurch, which is in the South Island of New Zealand. It was considered a fairly safe location um, by most people, fairly benign location. Um, and all their critical functions were in Christchurch. And then if you may recall 2011, I think there was a very major earthquake in Christchurch, very, very significant, uh, which destroyed the city. Um, and it's taken a long time. To, if you visit Christchurch now, it's still, the city center has still a lot of gaps where buildings are missing. Um, it was a very significant event. And although the data center and the control centers were not affected because they weren't too near the epicenter and they were in purpose-built buildings, Airways decided that it, to have one center is too vulnerable, even if they have a four back in the same location. And so they have recently completed a very major piece of work of building a second center in North Island and Auckland, where each center can run the whole flight information region, which is very large because it covers most of the Pacific, so South Pacific. Um, so that was their response to a recognized risk, very significant risk of earthquake or similar natural hazard in one location. So they've spent a lot of money, a lot of time and resources reducing risk. They still have plans. They still have coordinated systems, um, but they have put a huge amount of effort into reducing risk. And they're not the only ones, of course. Um, a lot of critical uh, infrastructure systems, they'll have a second control site. So that's a good example, I think, of risk reduction is the best form of defense, shall we say. Uh, it's got to be better than this or this. Um, incidentally, before they'd finished this work, they did have an outage for about 40 minutes in the main system, um, which did not reflect well to their owners who were of the government. Um, there was a lot of answers to be answered or questions asked and answers had to be given. Okay, so I've spent a bit of time talking there, um, half an hour. Does that make sense to people? Have you, has anyone got questions? Okay, it's quite, a, it's quite a concept, you know, he's got four R's. It can be applied to different types of emergencies. The ones we're really interested in aviation emergencies and business continuity, because that's what we're trying to learn at the moment. So in the, in the kind of readiness, what do you mean the difference between training, education? Sorry, I missed, I didn't catch all that. Uh, so you have the column of readiness, right? So for aviation emergency, it is training. For site emergencies, also training, but why it is in the workplace emergency? It is education. Okay, interesting. <laughs> Spotted, you got. <laughs> okay, um, I think because workplace uh, emergencies, often the people in the building or the workplace are not specialists, and you just have to tell people in this situation, run out the door, um, educate. This is an area of, I don't know, but there's chemical, dangerous chemicals here. Just tell people there's chemical chemicals. If you smell anything or you hear the alarm, go. 
So a simpler level of um, training, shall we say, educate people. Um, that's, I mean, yeah, there may be some emergencies where you'd have training, uh, but there's only so many words you can put on a slide like this. <laughs> yeah, very interesting. Thanks for spotting that. Yeah, that, that really the, the difference. You could have education here equally. You just educate people about the, the hazard and the response is easy. Follow the signs. Um, if a bell rings, leave. Uh, fire would be a good example. We don't train people to respond to fire. We just say, leave a building. You educate people, leave a building. Hmm. So uh, in the recovery column, you have brand management for for all of the aviation until down to the business continuity. So uh, do you mean that uh, uh, whatever the issue, big or small, brand management people have to involve? Uh, sorry, the, which part are you saying? The yeah. market recovery? No? Yeah. yeah, yeah. But, um, it's, it's just a really way to say um, this, these things may, are unlikely to affect your market. Yeah, this one might, true. Brand management. Yeah. Mm. Brand management. So, brand, because okay. mm -hmm. staff, you have brand management involved. So, uh, do you need the brand management people? Do they need to know everything about aviation? Do they have to, to have a career path like they come from other divisions so that they understand better whatever we are facing? Mm. Um, okay. I think in this case, um, it, it's about the the marketing people or the communication team, probably most importantly, to run, understand that these sort of events could happen. Do you have a plan for how you would protect the brand? Do you understand that this could happen? Have you thought about it? And usually the communication team will have a press release ready, for example. So they immediately can say something um, that helps to manage the impact from a perception point of view. Um, so certainly at this level, you would expect the communication team to have some ready to go messages. Um, but I don't quite know which message are used, but they're probably pre-written. Um, because you don't want to be thinking, what do we have to say now? It's happening too quickly. People want to know, particularly today with social media, the communication team, I say, should have, have a plan for certainly this, maybe one of these, say an airport or um, a significant facility like a hangar. Um, and here, be aware there's a range of events that could occur. They could impact customer service. So what are your messages you're going to get out? A message might be, we're aware of this. We have a team working on it. We'll give you an update shortly. Maybe a simple message, but yeah. Have to prepare like hundreds of scenarios. It's interesting. I personally don't think, I think what you need to do is understand the type of event rather than all the events. Just, okay, it's a localized event. People have or haven't been injured, for example. What do we say? I think the most beneficial to say is we have a team who are working on a problem. We will get a communication to you as soon as possible. And because you've exercised it, it's likely they might even be part of the, the response team. So I'll give an example. Because of SARS, I spent a lot of time myself developing a pandemic response plan for New Zealand. Um, and then there was SARS-2. Um, and we thought, oh, this is going to happen. Look at history. We, there will be a pandemic. It's likely to start in Asia because that seems to be where, like China and whatever. OK, that will affect us because we fly in Asia. We need to have a pandemic response plan. So we spent a lot of effort developing a very significant response plan, and then ran two major exercises. The first one did not go particularly well. The second one went very well. 
but we included you we brought union representatives to observe we brought government agencies to observe we really did it on a big scale and part of the thing that we really really worked on was what are the communications that we're going to have to put out how are we going to communicate with customers how are we going to communicate with staff how are we going to communicate with government agencies how are we communicating with overseas other airlines that we work with like star alliance and the, the communication team had a whole piece around brand management they really took it to heart they really were very serious and they were very good at it every time we had an instant they immediately knew what to say stakeholder um, and also communicate with staff to give staff assurance that, you know, maybe some of the staff had lost colleagues, who knows, um, or were worried about colleagues. What is going on? So this piece, I think, is really important. It, we could call it communications, maybe. Uh, but the idea is to really give confidence that this organization has suffered a disrupt, but it is professional and it is responding appropriately. Mm. Does that make sense? Yes, yes. Yeah, yeah. I think that, that exercise for me was, was a highlight in my career as a business continuity manager, I must admit, because the, sec the first one went very poorly. I felt about this small. <laughs> um, the second one, I learned my lessons. I thought, right, I'm going to get this right. Everyone's ready. The exec team was fully briefed. All the stakeholders understood. We got all the people in. We put a lot of effort into working out scenarios that we were going to exercise. We even had news reports done for us by professional news readers. So we could put the television on and say, and show them the news as if it was for real. A face they recognized. Yeah. You know? um, and the communication team, they were, they fully understood how important it was. Um, and they did, I think they did an exceptional job at really working out how they were going to respond for not just pandemics, but any, any emergency. Mm -hmm. I'll just say, uh, give you a few examples. We had a, we have here a very entertaining politician. He's a Maori guy, so an indigenous um, lawyer, very sharp mind. Um, and he's always got a wise, wise crack, um, you know, a clever thing to say. Um, and at the time, he was a deputy prime minister. So in the exercise, we pretended he was in America and demanding to come home, even though the border was being closed. So how do we respond to that? The aircraft was in flight and he's demanding the crew fly me home um we had a, a rugby sevens match as you know rugby's big sport in new zealand all blacks. <laughs> we all blacks uh, so we just pretended the international the world sevens rugby team uh competition was happening in in hong kong and so we had thousands of passengers who were trying to get home from hong kong despite the borders being shut so we tried to make it as, shall we say, a little entertaining as well, really challenging the executive team and the managers on, well, how are we going to do this? What are we going to do? Um, yeah, it was quite good fun, but, um, but it was very educational for a lot of people, including the government agencies, because they recognized then the significance of shutting the borders and how challenging that would be. Um, and I personally didn't think it would happen. I didn't think we'd shut borders in a pandemic. We have. I was wrong. Uh, as you probably know, uh, like Vietnam, our response, uh, the initial response was very effective and it was, it was shutting the borders. Um, yeah, so um, I really enjoyed that. Um, but it was a lot of work. And I would say, again, 
one of the most important things we learned is communications and brand management. Not just brand management, but communications. Given all the stakeholders confidence that we knew what we would know what we were doing and we were responding appropriately. Mm. I think as a flag carrier, it's really important. Some, you know, the big airlines, the lines that represent a country, it's really important to get this right. Mm. So as far as we come to the four phases of the BTM, I think uh, it's a little bit of quite high level. So do you think that the CEO should take this course also? <laughs> because <I said laughs> these are the, the people who are attending the, the, the meetings. Most of us are middle class manager, right? Mm. Why don't the, it's come from top down also? Yeah, no, it's a really interesting point. And um, I, I think certainly, my own experience is because I was middle management when I was had that role was how do you how do you communicate upwards the importance of doing this? How do you justify the resources? Um, and I think that is part of a business continuity manager's role is is being explaining not only downwards but always upwards, also upwards this is important we do this well and then helping to develop a system with the other teams that is effective and appropriate for your organization um, and it takes time um, but i think the senior team needs to be perhaps educated <laughs> rather than trained <laughs> um, about it um, about how it's done you wouldn't expect them to be uh, specialists in it. That's what we have specialists for. Um, but certainly um, the education part of a senior team is part of this. We need education perhaps should be written here, educating upwards, educating downwards. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, uh, it is part of it. I think to develop a framework the senior team needs to understand why it's been done, how much resource it is appropriate, and their role in it. Mm. So, I mean, again, example, and since I left Air New Zealand, I've been called back many times to assist with exercises where the senior executive team are in the exercise. Every single one of them, the chief executive, Chief Financial Officer, um, Human Resources, Head of Engineering, they're all in the exercise. They're not running the exercise, that's done by the operational level, but they're all involved in making the strategic decisions and prioritizing. Uh, and certainly last time I was involved, which is probably about, I don't know, five years ago, that was happening three times a year. Three times a year, the senior executive team was involved in an exercise. Yeah. Not always a business continuity exercise. Sometimes it was an emergency exercise, you know, aircraft loss, but sometimes a, a business continuity one. Mm. And I think that's where um, the problem with social media, the problem with the effect of social media on communication was first recognized in one of those exercises. It was an exercise to do with environmental harm, an oil spill, fuel spill on the airport. And in the exercise, we threw in the idea that the public or the press knew more about what was happening than the senior team because the press were there at the airport. So how does a communication team manage that problem? Mm. But it's a very good point you make. Yeah, everyone has to understand their part in, in the system. Mm. And clearly the senior team need to be involved in approving a framework. Mm.
Okay. Uh, any more questions? Does everyone sort of understand what these four are? So the takeaway here, the key takeaway is the risk reduction is a really important piece and can save a lot of a lot of heartache uh, because your response is a lot easier because you've planned it, you've reduced the chance of it happening, and you know how you're going to respond. Okay. Um, so, hello. Was that a question? No. Okay. So, haven't talked about how important risk reduction is. And in response to the question earlier today about whether you should have attended a risk management course. The next part is about back to basics on risk management. Next few slides. Okay, any questions before we move on to them? Now, this will start today, but I don't think we'll finish the risk part today because um, I'm conscious that this is an important piece. If we're going to reduce risk as part of business continuity management, we need to know how to do risk management. Okay. An introduction to risk assessment. Okay, so firstly, what do we mean by risk? What is the de definition of risk? And all the material I'm going to present is from the International Standard on Risk Management, um, International Standard 31,031,000. First point, what do we mean by risk? This is a formal definition of risk. Risk is the effect of uncertainty on the, it's actually the achievement of objectives. This is the English definition, the French definition, because these standards are first published in English and French. The French definition is the effect of uncertainty on the achievement of objectives. Now that might be a bit of a surprise people. Is that what risk means? This is really important. Um, because some people will say risk and they think safety. Some people and they think finance. So why do two different people think about risk in different ways? It's because they're thinking about different objectives. A safety, someone thinking safety risk is thinking about the objective of being safe. So the risk is not being safe. A finance person is thinking about making money or protecting value. The objective is to protect value or is to grow the business. So when they say risk, they're thinking the chance of not growing a business or the chance of losing value. So that's why risk is defined formally as the effect of uncertainty on achievement objectives. Now I'll come back to why this is important in a minute. Um, it's just a few notes first we've got to, um, to add about risk. Um, and these are the notes um, straight out of the international standard. In theory, you can have upside risk and downside risk. Uncertainty can be positive and negative. We'll skip over that now because we're really only interested in downside risk now for business continuity. What could impact negatively impact a business? As I said, the objectives can have different aspects. We could have financial objective, health and safety objective, and environmental objective. Now these objectives can be seen at different levels, a strategic objective,
with everyone trained and do it safely. Um, or a process, objective mind to be complete a process. So we have to be clear what our objective is and at what level we're talking. Just a few other notes. So we often describe risk as a potential event or consequence or combination of these. What's the risk associated with a fire, for example? And it's likely to be expressed in terms of a combination of a consequence, how bad the fire is, for example, and under what circumstances, and how likely it is to occur. Is it likely to occur, unlikely to occur? Is it a rare event or frequent event, for example? So this can be done at quite a complex level by analysis, or it can be done at quite a simple level, what we call a qualitative approach. We simply use terms. A major consequence probably could probably exist occur. So that's quite a high risk. A very significant consequence, but it's unlikely to occur. So that's a lower level of risk. So um, that's the definition of risk. It's determined by objectives, and we'll come to why that's important. And in simple terms, we're trying to avoid a consequence. Risk management is avoiding a consequence. And the level of risk is dependent on how bad it is and how likely it is to occur. More frequent is higher risk. More harm is higher risk. Okay, and lastly, we're talking about the future. We're not quite sure how likely, we're not quite sure how bad it could be. So there's a level of uncertainty, but we have to accept we're not quite sure, but we can make good judgments from experience and looking at other airlines or looking across the aviation business, we can say, well, it's quite likely or it does happen. We've seen it happening elsewhere. so. We think it's quite likely. Never seen that happen, but we know it could happen. Okay, that's probably a rare event. So we can make good professional judgments on how likely something is and how bad it's likely to be. So we don't have to do too much analysis. We just use our good professional judgment. So what do we mean? The other point is what do we mean by objective? It's what we're trying to achieve. Yeah. Okay. Uh, as I said, ISO 31000 is a global risk management standard. So everything I'm going to talk about is from that standard. I'm going to skip over this now to this one. That international standard is quite small. Uh, it's only about 20 pages, which to me means I've, the um, author's got it about right because he didn't have to write too much. Um, I should remark I was on the committee that helped write it, but it took five years and uh, 50 people involved. And we went all around the world meeting up to talk about it. So there's a lot of effort went into it, a lot of good ideas from all sorts of people. And eventually we wrote a standard. Um, and it consists of three main parts, a principles, a framework, and process. And this risk management process is what most people know. Um, the principles though are very important. The idea of a purpose of risk management is to value creation and protect, is to protect value. <coughs> okay. Um, um, <coughs> I'll just quickly go over principles. Um, it's a structured process. It's customized, so you don't have to do it like someone else did it. You do it as suits you. 
uh, it's dynamic. It, it, risk can change. If a business changes, risk change. So you do it again. You use the best available information you might have. Um, and you continually improve. So always thinking, OK, have we got this right? Do we want to do it again? Our last point is it's integrated. When you make a decision, say, to change a business or change a process, you do the risk management on that. So in this case, you think about the business continuity when you design your process or when you decide to occupy a new building. You think, OK, how, we, how important is this building? How robust does it need to be? Do we need two power supplies? Questions like that. You make those decisions at the time, not afterwards. Okay, I could spend a lot of time on those principles, but I think that's all we need to today. Where I'm going to spend my time is this piece here. Um, so I spend our time. It's called the risk management process. And I'm sure many of you have seen it before. You might have seen a slightly different version of this drawing. This is the newer design, but it's the same diagram. Okay. Okay, so I'm a bit mindful. I'm giving you quite a lot of information here. Uh, so we talked about how important it is to understand risk, to reduce risk. And so we're now we're looking to look at how we do that. Um, and I'm mindful that not everyone will have attended a risk management course. And that did come up earlier. So that's why we're now going to just spend some time, certainly the rest of today, just talking about this process. OK, so you see it's got a number of steps. Um, and effectively, it starts from the top and it works way down. And then it's got these down on the side. So we'll start here, which is basically, you need to understand the context for your risk uh, assessment process that you're going to go through. Um, the context means what's the environment. For example, what laws have to be applied? What do you have to do? Uh, who is involved? How dynamic is the situation? Are things changing rapidly or is it a very static environment? What are we interested in and what are we not interested in? What's the scope of our work? We want to just do the piece that's important. And what are the criteria? How much risk are we? Context. We handle a lot of passengers. We're complex business. It's all part of a context. Understanding, OK, this is the environment in which we work and live. Then we have to carry the risk assessment. So the first thing you need to do is identify the risks. Sorry, one face I missed here is what's the objective? I haven't told you how important it was to understand the objective. What is the objective? Because this is how we're going to define risk. So for business continuity management, the objective is what is the purpose of your department? What is the purpose of this facility? What is the purpose of this function? So, for example, the objective might be to process bookings. So as a, a system, it processes bookings. The objective is process bookings on time, within you know seconds, whatever it is. Um, flight planning. The objective is to plan flights and to do it on time. Um, weight and balance is to ensure the aircraft is correctly weight and balanced before takeoff. That's real time. Do it as you need to do it. So each function in the business has an objective. Maintain aircraft, um, load baggage, uh, prepare cargo, um, Ensure we pay our tax on time, pay people, maintain our buildings. You know, there's all sorts of departments all doing their piece. Um, one might be carry out safety analysis. You know, 
it was always different departments, different objectives. And part of their context is how quickly they have to do it, how repeatedly they have to do it. Are they real time function? Is this a real time objective? Is it a business critical function? Is it a support function? Is it a leadership function? This is all this piece here. You've got to understand the objective because that's what we mean by risk. What is the chance? Firstly, what could stop us meeting that objective? Loss of power, loss of people, um, loss of communications, um, no, no facility. So you've got to go through and think, what would stop us doing what we're there for? What is our purpose? What could stop us doing that? So that's the first step. And that isn't com too complicated, as long as you think fairly broadly. What is everything we need to, make, to allow us to do our work? We need light, we need power, we need water, we need data, we need connectivity, we need desks, we need seats, we need telephones, we need trained people. And how quickly do we, well, we have to do it all the time or we have to do it every week. Just each. Let's say it happens once a year. Let's say it happens every two years. Okay, it happens. Okay, what, how, what effect would that have? And how long is it likely to be out, for example? So you can ask yourselves these fairly simple questions and can't work out a level of risk by likelihood and consequence. Having analyzed that, so you don't have to be complicated. You can do it qualitatively, best professional judgment. Maybe do some research, look around the world, how often does that happen? Look at your own history. How often does this happen? Um, ask around colleagues and then evaluate. Well, how important is that? Does my, does my job depend on it? <laughs> you know, however you judge it, how important? Okay, we decide, well, it's important that we protect against this, but not that one. Water, we can do without water, we can just bring it in. People can bring bottles of water if they need. But power, no, we can't do without power. Okay. So how do we treat that? What's the simplest way, what's the most effective way of treating this? Now, treat, we mean how do we mitigate that risk? So power, it might be Everyone uses a laptop in de instead of desktops because we can pick them up and take them somewhere else and they've got batteries. Or it might be we'll have an UPS, uninterrupted power supply, protecting our immediate Wi Fi network, for example. It could be something really simple, but it might be more complicated. We actually ne need connectivity with our mainframe or our main servers that aren't located close by. So we need to ensure we have good communications. How do we treat that? We have two communication channels, for example, and we have powers backup to ensure they work. So it, it's a relatively simple process, but it's important it's done in a structured way. Um, really rigorously thinking, okay, here's all the threats to a business. This is what we have to achieve. This is what we, why we exist. These are what would stop us doing that. What is the best way to respond? What is an appropriate, effective way of responding? So that case study I gave of the operation center, we actually had a whole range of departments, all relied on the same power supply, the same communication networks, or mainly. Um, and so we thought, well, a coordinated response is the way. Every, all of these departments have to work. Let's 
set up an alternative location that has different power supplies, different communication networks, let's put some extra aerials in and ensure they are all protected with one management plan, one business management plan. Conceptually, they could have done it each themselves. You know, flight planning could have said, well, we're going to go over to that building and we're going to have some spare computers and we're going to get an IT department to connect us up. And then another part of the department might have said, well, we're going to go over there and we're going to do this. Bit discord and bit disconnected lack of coordination there. So that's where having a business continuity function is really useful because it can get everyone to work together and come up with a best solution. But you do need to go through this. You need to think, well, what would stop us meeting our objectives? How likely it is and therefore, how much effort should we do to protect it? How can we protect ourselves? That's essentially the process. Then you write your plan or you prepare your alternatives, your spare telephones, whatever it might be. Um, and then from time to time, you review and monitor because of changing staff, all our staff are aware of our plans to all of everyone. Okay, we need to do some more training or education. Um, have we communicated and consulted? Is there another department who want to use the same facility as we were going to use, but we haven't, they haven't told us? And you all turn up at the wrong facility and all shout, trying to shout, push for desks. That happens. Um, have we communicated upwards and downwards? Sorry, excuse me. Have we trained everyone? Sorry, I'm just going over again. So it's a relatively simple process, but it needs to be done correctly while using the same tools. So everyone is working through the same process and assessing risk in the same way. Okay, I'm mindful of time now. It's five minutes to go before close. Um, so I'm proposing to stop there, you'd be pleased to know, before moving on, perhaps refresh our minds in the morning and then move into the next step of that, show how that's done in practice. But before we close, has anyone got any questions on this piece? Um, I assume some people will have seen this before, uh, but some will not. I think it's, I'm aware it's the end of a long day for you. So maybe I'll ask the question again in the morning. Um, to um, before we kick off again. But before we close, is anyone any immediate questions, immediate points? We do have some sharp people around who are asking some pretty sharp questions, I'm, I'm aware. Uh, yes, Joanne, as we have the quizzes, so would you like to have that as homework for everybody to do some research? Oh, right, yes, okay. Thank you. Do you want to put that up now? Uh, right, just a moment. Um, các anh chị ơi, thì uh, thầy cũng bảo là chắc là mình sẽ kết thúc uh, cái cái uh, buổi học ngày hôm nay bằng cái cái sơ đồ này. Tuy nhiên thì trước khi kết thúc thì thầy cũng muốn giới thiệu cho các anh chị cái bài tập về nhà của ngày hôm nay nhá. Thì chúng ta sẽ có một cái quiz nhỏ khoảng độ 10 câu hỏi. À, thì bọn em sẽ gửi cái link về email cho mọi người mọi người sẽ về cố gắng để mà điền vào và sau đó thì mình sẽ review cho sáng ngày mai để xem là cái mức độ mình hiểu bài đến đâu mình sẽ có cái thắc mắc gì với thầy kiểu đêm nay thầy được được một tiền tác giả nếu mà chúng mày làm hai điều thì em xin được sâu về cái câu hỏi đấy ạ bây giờ là vui rồi không ạ về nhà về nhà làm nếu mọi người có thời gian thì thầy cũng bảo là hôm nay là một ngày khá là dài hai thứ hai đúng không ạ yes you see our press brief Yeah. Uh, sorry, I'm not seeing at the moment. Um, why not? Ah, yes, I see it. Got it. Yep. Okay. 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 Okay.
Ui, thì câu hỏi mở thì mình sẽ điền những cái kiến thức của mình hoặc là những cái gì mà mình tìm hiểu được Yes, so I just introduced that we have two types of questions. Will be multiple choice and also the open question that people can fill in some context and, and the uh, paragraphs and the ideas and experiences in that. Mm -hmm. You want to go uh, over just to introduce. Okay. So, so the first question is name one of the most significant disruptions to the global aviation sector that has occurred within the last 30 years. <laughs> so, <laughs> so it's a, a very simple one. I'm sure you can all do this. But remember, I put up that diagram, which were the five better K, no, IATA suggest are the five significant ones. But there were a few examples given by yourselves. So a simple question, just give an example in, in the answer. <laughs> The, the next question is a multi-choice question. So you just select one you think. Which, what organization requires that airlines and airports develop, develop, sorry, as a type of a business continuity plan. So if you recall, I set out, I went through some of the rules of one of these organizations. Um, was it a CAO? Was I ARTA? Was it the United Nations or was it the European Union? So, it's probably fairly simple. Um, question three, within the course material presented, which of the following is a correct response to the very worst case disruption? So if you recall, I suggested there's four levels of response. And at the top, the red at the top, I called it one of these four. So which one was it? The very worst case at the top, a rare but really significant event. So that's question three. Question four, which of the following comes first as part of business continuity management? So this is with four R's. Which comes first? Is it response? Is it recovery? Is it readiness or is it reduction? Fifth question, which of the following is a key advantage of a car? Uh, we're going to have to skip this one because that's, those are the slides I skipped earlier. I'm sorry. Can we skip question five? We might come to it later tomorrow. Um, when carrying out a business conjugate risk assessment, which represents the highest level of risk? So I've only just touched on this. So it's, um, I think hopefully most people have got it. Is it a major consequence that's likely to occur or is it a minor consequence that's unlikely to occur? So I think common sense. So this is back to that four level question. Now you remember we talked about types of event and we talked about types of response. If a typical day-to-day -day aviation disruption event occurs, so normal business as usual disruption, which is the most suitable response? Do you, we use SOPs? Do we use the emergency team? Do we call in the help of a senior leadership team? Or do we pull out a major disruption plan? So I think you should all get that. Um, and I introduced a global risk continuity management standard. Uh, I didn't say anything nice about it. <laughs> um, I personally wouldn't use it, but it exists. So which one was it? Mm -hmm. uh, question nine, list three risks that in your opinion may occur during recovery from a COVID. COVID pandemic. So this is a one we haven't touched on, but it'll be interesting to see whether people have thought about risks that might occur during the recovery from a COVID pandemic. So if you remember, one of the four hours is recovery. No right or wrong answers, just it would be interesting to see what, whether people have thought about that. And my last question, each of these four terms is used in business continuity planning, uh, fill in the blanks. So what does ITDR stand for? What does BCM stand for? What does BCP stand for? And what does EMP stand for, which KO used that term? So a little bit of homework, but I think most of them are pretty easy, but skip question five. Còn ạ, thì em chỉ nhắc lại cái bộ câu hỏi thì mình sẽ không cần phải trả lời câu số 5 ạ. 
À, còn lại các câu hỏi khác thì thầy cũng muốn là mọi người sẽ cố gắng hết sức và làm các câu hỏi. Cảm ơn ạ. Anh, anh bên phải em làm xong rồi đây. Kiên <cười> <cười> quang vậy đúng hết cảm trăm phần trăm. Yes, I think it's um, it's all done. So we can say uh, say for tomorrow we got long day today. <laughs> okay. Thank you, everyone. Uh, see you in the morning. Yes. Yeah. Thanks, you, Ben. <laughs>